Salutations, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the Losses of Europe. I'm your host, Ham Mokalova, and right now we talk about America seeing the photos. We've reached an agreement with the Americans regarding their lost pilot. American leadership has notified us, and we will be receiving the photos they took of our territory in exchange. We will send this pilot back home to their country or his country. We also expect an apology in the coming days. Even though we lost the pilot, this is by no means a diplomatic failure. The Americans simply caved into our demands and both of us got what we wanted out of the discussions. Our propaganda machine has its work cut out for it. We will certainly use this accident to paint the Americans in a more negative light. Even with this, our citizens are already celebrating the diplomatic victory back at home. The world has been saved yet again from the third nuclear war. For now, let's just hope the Americans don't discover the bruises we gave their pilots. These photos look stunning. An emergency meeting. Speer wanted to bury his face in sands. Of course, this would happen the only time a certain revolt ever succeeds and it's under him. Across from him sat the man of the Gang of Four, each looking similarly downtrodden to Speer. Next to them sat Hans Spado, calm as always, though his uncomfortable fidgeting did betray a hint of worry. Each of these men would occasionally look over to the phone on Speer's desk, which at any second was all but certain to ring with the voice of Ferdinand Schoener. Speer could also imagine the look of glee on Schoener's face as he heard the news, and he shuddered to think of the tongue lashing that would come. So, Speer quietly said, how many dudes were in that factory? Helmut fidgeted uncomfortably about <clears throat> 800, my big daddy. Christ, Speer sighed, and how many do we estimate are still fighting? A long, uncomfortable silence punctuated the air as each of the men in the office looked at each other. Finally, Spado spoke up. We estimate between 200 and 300, but there's no way of knowing how many are inside the wings. Speer audibly groaned. I don't see why we don't move in. Take the factory back and this mess. With the amount of hostages they've got in there, Schmidt questioned, we'd be lucky if we get 10 of them out alive if we throw the Wehrmacht in. Besides that, Kiesinger interrupted, we've already received some ground reports that students from nearby universities are aiding escaping slaves hiding, who are hiding from police patrols. Their reaction to a full-blown shootout may be ugly. Must we speak of the politics of the matter? This is the worst hostage crisis we've ever faced in our history, Spado interjected. Now, if you would allow me, I have a plan. The phone rang and each of the men tensed up. Slowly, Speer picked it up. He listened for a moment and then held the receiver away from his ear to notify the others. It's Shona. Now, we got a couple comments from yesterday and one of the main ones was like, we need to get the Crimea back, which we're trying to do. We have an 83% chance of the mission succeeding. So we're working on it. Don't worry, we're working on it. And thank you to everyone who said that just because... Sometimes I forget things, or just don't know that we have to invest in things, but we need to invest in Austin, Caucasian, and the Volga, for now, which is not going to be easy, because we know political power, uh, but this is pretty good, and we pretty much already have France under our, our hand, so Germans, well, we went, up, went out of three because they're at 14, so France is ours, so actually, technically, goodbye, and that should be the last one, and that was another comment to get France locked uh, under us, just because uh, we might be able to get Brittany that way, and currently, of course, we're trying to open up the doors again, so if you like to read about this one again... Please go right ahead. But I only did that one so we can get more political power. Because we really, 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 really need that political power. A trip out back. Now that the matter of so societal organization has been addressed, there's one less administrative matter that requires a daddy's attention. <clears throat> Rather, a lot of militaries and their sympathizers have escaped unnoticed by hiding within the bureaucracy. The monster uniform has ev evidently made a nest for its kin within the dock and oft forgotten corners of the Reich, concerning but nothing we can't deal with. With the Burger Creek now far behind us, we cannot simply unleash your R&D on the bureaucracy to clean these reps out. There might be adverse effects to another wave of bloodshed at this relatively peaceful time. All we really need to do is draft up some lists and reassign the most problematic individuals to positions far away from the Reich Chancellery. The further they are away from Germania, the weaker the Field Marshal's grip on the Wehrmacht. <coughs> Which actually does make sense. Cool. And England and Wales are at war. Shona's plan. Herr Shona, please calm yourself. My big daddy, I will call myself when the situation is no longer volatile. For now, we are looking at the worst slave revolt in years. How could you expect any good citizen to be calm in such a situation? The five other men in the room could barely make out Schoenitz's voice, tinny and canned as it was. Speer himself could hear all too much of it. The failed marshal was practically screaming into his ear. He leaned back in his chair, dis distancing himself from the receiver. If he didn't, the urge to hang up on the man would eventually overpower him. So what's your suggestion, Ferdinand? I'm sure I can guess the gist of it, he asked. There was a moment of silence on the other end, and the rest of the room leaned to hear it better. Send in the tanks, the armored cars, and planes of Wehrmacht. Take them out. Each of the men in the room reacted in their own special way. Schmidt threw his hands up in the air, Spado sighed, and the other man of the gang exchanged looks of displeasure. Speer, however, remained silent. As fast as you can, casualties be darned. If we give them up even an inch, they'll take a mile, and we'll lose control in a daze. We'll consider it, Speer said flatly, um, placing the phones faced on the desk. Face up on the desk. Shona's continued rant went unnoticed in the commotion that followed. In a moment, the gang began to shout over one another and their objections. Cries of murder, pig, and idiot, which Speer decided to assume were directed at Shona, rebounded through the room. Speer's face remained unmoved. Finally, Spado stood, and the rest of the men of silence themselves. My Fuhrer, I think you should hear me out before we make any choices on the matter. 
I believe your counsel's suggestion as well. Judging by that <clears throat> outburst, Spidel stated. The gang led by Schmidt voiced their agreement. Very well speak, Cal Spidel. Oh boy. Hey, let's get some political power for now. But we're definitely going to need that. Oh my goodness, we're definitely going to need that. But at least we're in between for now. It's actually, it might actually lean towards us very, very soon, so that's not too bad. Um, charge reactionaries with choosing. We could, we could spend stuff like that, but we're already at 52%, so I'm not really too concerned about that. Oh, we can invest it in here too, but we do need the PP to take it down on mega corporations. And this will be done in about 40 days, which isn't too bad, actually. So, anything here we can do? Ah, uh, yes, that'll be good to do. Just finish them off. Awesome. Now, Siemens is vulnerable. Uh, Ernst von Siemens. And that's cool. Close that out, close it out. Look at this one. Uh, oh, wow. This is... Oh, this is a little glitched up right now. The USA is just still there. Uh, let me see if I can get this one. So, we are 338 billion. Okay, that's not too bad. Not great. 20 members. Um... We can't dismantle them, can we? Oh, it's because... That's right, because you guys were... No, I thought you guys said this, the Reichsvecco was owning this one, not Siemens. Okay, we got Siemens gun! They're dismantled! Great! Joyous occasion. Well, the first one of three is gone. I feel pretty good about that. Hey, got 50 more political power, too. And that's because we did the one down here, which we were purging, basically, Nazis. Nice. National Socialism, Oberlander, who really wants to get rid of us. But we got to keep doing this one. We have to. Um, also, here you go. While well, the past decades have seen considerable success with the Germanization of Oslo, much of the region's industries is either non-operational or completely obsolete. In particular, the Belarusian state is in a state of disrepair and ruin, with much of the previous Austin administration neglecting to cultivate any means of foreign investment or economic opportunity within the region. We must right the wrongs of our forefathers if we're to research German economic influence in the region. We have to. Hey, only a billion, look at that, that's pretty good. And we do have a cup of coffee to keep us nice and warm while we talk about the slave revolt. Siemens dismantled. Ernst von Siemens entered the top office in the Reichswerk Ministerium, a neutral expression on his face. He knew, of course, the reason for his summon he was not a fool, and while part of him had secretly hoped for this moment to come, another part of him, the cold, calculative part that any serious entrepreneur needs in order to survive, couldn't help feeling dejected. Reichsminister came Geilenberg's polite, if cold, salute. Um, Wer wird Schaffsfeuer? was Ludwig Erhard's equally polite, but perhaps a lot a little bit less cold answer. Von Siemens exhaled and looked in the minister's eyes. There's no need for formalities, Herr he, he, Erhard. It doesn't take a genius to know why I've been called here. A clean cut is better than a game of cat and mouse. Ludwig nodded. Unlike all the others, uh, Wer wir von Siemens had been a steadfast if interested ally in his reforms. Together, they had worked to reduce the needs for slaves in the other conglomerates, and the entrepreneur had used its influence to protect the minister from economic backlash on the other company's part. Still, free market didn't admit exceptions, and they both knew that. In light of the new economic policy, Siemens to, is to be stripped of its privileges and will, from now on, operate as a normal company in a free market. When von Siemens looked at him in surprise, Erhard chuckled. You must have come here expecting dismantlement, didn't you? It's almost a pity Siemens is too tightly knit to be broken down, and it's not big enough to pose a threat to fair competition. Consider yourself lucky. And Svon Siemens felt once again that the two parts of his mind agitating. One was relieved that the blow had proven much lighter than expected, while the other was already limiting the losses still. He decided to listen to the first, if only this once. Thank you, Rex Minister, he said, for then excusing himself. The two shook hands, and the office returned silent. A bit of sweet moment. Hey, more regime stability and political power? We could really use that. We could really, really use that. Uh... In the Caucasus, the rich natural resources and the cheap labor within the Caucasus region has led to a rather unhealthy relationship between Caucasus and Germany. Working conditions in RK Caucasus are notoriously atrocious, with German overlord exploring a cheap and inexperienced labor pool. We must address these horrendous working conditions in Caucasus if we are to foster any concrete economic growth. And we're almost done with that, which is still going to cost a lot of PP, but that's okay. Bug political enemies, yes please, it's still going up very nicely. And Spido's plan. Hans Spido took a deep breath. Each of the men around him watched his every move, his every twitch. He made sure to minimize any nervous fidgeting before he even began. My proposal is similar to the failed marshal's proposal, though I will say it was more refined than the blunt solution my colleague provides. In short, there is no way that this situation can be dealt with in such a heavy-handed way. If you wish to keep casualties low, however, if we negotiate, we give in to the slaves and the threats. Every slave in the Reich will see us give in and assume they can do the same. We'll see a revolt across Germany within a month or if we give in, mark my words. You coward, what do you suggest would take too far long to do? The news will be all over Germany by the time your plan is ready. And then Shona shouted to make himself audible through the phone. Speer paused for a moment to listen before motioning for Spado to continue placing his hand over the speaker to muffle the noise. My suggestion would be to take a slow, cautious, yet tough approach on these slaves. An infiltration, coordinated with their best units, could potentially result in catching the rebels off guard. If we do this right, we could seize control of the factories without too much bloodshed. My top men have already begun drawing out a plan if you wish for it. You idiot, you think you're ruling out even trying to negotiate because of what you think will happen? You know better than the butcher on the other end of the telephone, Schmidt badly objected. The rest of the gang nodded, though the reaction was much less strong than that of Schmidt.
I'm not suggesting we go and kill all of them, Helmut. I'm suggesting we put this down before it spreads. Spado wheeled around angrily. A shouting mesh erupted before Speer with a heavy slap of the table, brought everyone to order. He sat before turning to Schmidt. Herr Schmidt, the floor is yours. Don't you love it? Everything's a mess. Everything is a mess. The Schmidt proposal. Schmidt stood, the rest of the gang watching him closely. He cleared his throat before he began, making sure to stand as upright as he could. Speer watched him intently as he began. My fear, while the other proposals that your generals have brought before us could certainly hold some merit, the fact remains that they are simply too harsh to be considered. If we pull off any form of military maneuver against the slaves, the liberals rely on so heavily will explode, after all. Would such an oppressive man maneuver not directly contradict your supposed wish to free the slaves? No. If you wish to come out of this with your hide intact, you must come to the table with the slaves. This doesn't mean we have to give in to all their demands, of course, but a negotiation would certainly go down well with your base. Besides, while Herr Spidel seems to think negotiation would encourage revolt, I believe it would have the opposite effect after all. Would the slaves not believe you truly mean what you have to say if you talk to a revolting group? Shona's voice cut in at a volume loud enough for all to hear. You traitor, you imbecile fool. You think the slaves can be negotiated with? You think this won't encourage lawlessness? My fear. I cannot stand with such a ridiculously stupid action. Shpado uncomfortably cut in on Shona's continued rent. Well, it pains me to say it. I have to agree with Shona on this point. Negotiation, as I said, will only breed for the revolt. To give in is to set the precedent that we are willing to give in to violence and chaos. We'll only see unrest if we give in for stability's sake. Schmidt did not take this robot lightly. You think this is because you're too wrapped up and disciplined to see the human side of things? We're running out of time to make a decision here, my Fuhrer. If we don't negotiate, blood will run through the streets of Frankfurt, and a claim to the reformism and slave freedom will forever be damaged. Speer sat in silence for a moment, running through all the possibilities he could think of. The men in the room stood silently, waiting for a reaction that could change Germany forever. And it, this one does... This one is extremely important. Do what we must. We must become... We must be moderate, Heishpado. Do what you can. We must be true to ourselves, Herr Schmidt, do what you will. In which I'll see you in just a little bit. Alright, everyone. So, I think there's like... I really didn't understand this earlier. So, we have the conservative path for Speer, which we're not doing, obviously. we got the full reformist path, and there's like another path as well. I think for right now, because we're reformist, we gotta go be true to ourselves. Herr Schmidt, do what you will. The reformist cause and the right benefits from this, costing us 2.5% stability. And another 2.5% stability, but... And apparently we need to send him a loan, perhaps. So, we'll see about that. And, right, and very good. Very nice. Um, hopefully, we, I, I'm just more worried about getting this one done, so we'll see what happens. Anything up here? Uh, 43 political power. We have 54% regime stability. Hopefully, we don't get too hard, or I'll have to tear my hair out and go back and get some more regime stability, but whatever. Hey, look, 3 out of... That's, that's actually really good. Yeah, I'm not going to spend political power. Naval speed? We actually have some naval speed. Look at that. Um... Up to three, yeah, I don't, I can't even be bothered doing this. So, do what we will. The room, which had been almost bursting with sound, was dead. went dead silent. Spiro's eyes shot to Speer in disbelief. Schmidt's eyes widened, and the rest of the gang's attention quickly shot directly to the phone. The moment of silence would not last for long. The telephone on the desk, which had been almost forgotten about in the chaos, quickly grabbed everyone's attention with a screech of static. Shona's voice, now almost as loud as if he'd been in the room, exploded from the speaker so ferociously that the phone nearly rattled off the table. My fear, you can't be serious. Are you truly suggesting that we not only put down a rebellion, but negotiate with them? They're slaves. If we negotiate, we give in to the decadent lesser races. We give in to those we own. Do you really think that the less the other slaves will look at us uh, give in to a slave revolt and not get the idea to do the same? Yeah, sure, I thought about this all up, and this is the obvious solution if our agenda is to be followed and believed. Besides, your solution is less of a fix and more of a massacre. Speer flatly replied. The look on his face clearly betrayed his opinion on the field marshal of the other room in the room. Uh, to the other men in the room. My solution may not be weak enough for you bleeding hearts, but it will work. I cannot in any way support such a foolish, naive choice. Well, Herr Shona, I'll take your complaints into consideration, Spear spat as blandly as possible, before unceremoniously placing the phone back into the receiver. Almost immediately, he was beset upon by Schmidt, who spent the better part of the next five minutes praising Speer's choice before rushing from the room, quickly being followed by the gang. Spado stuck around a little longer to give his thoughts, mostly cautious, cautionary words against excessive looseness to revolters, though Speer could tell he was holding back some of his more choice words. Finally, when everyone was gone, Speer leaned back in his seat and stared out of his window. He couldn't help but think of the fiery speeches against him that were sure to come from all sectors. It was certainly going to hurt him with Ahea and the conservatives, indeed. He almost regretted his choice for the amount of problems it would open up. At the end of the day, though, at least he knew it was a moral one. Schmidt can get it done. Send in the negotiator. And a trip out back. Cool. Okay, so that's all done. Very nice. Um, I don't think we can do it. Oh, wait. Yes, we can, maybe? Anything else here? No, because we already did that one, and that was for uh, Siemens. So, that's okay. Uh... We'll probably do Rexvec next, just because that's probably the best one to do. Hopefully, the other guy gets stuff done. The sins of the... Oh, oh, we get more political power. You are not the sins of the sun. Oh, we do need more regime stability. Okay, so we'll work on that as time goes on. The mistakes of the past. <clears throat> I really want that political power. 
We really need more political power, but we can maybe wait a little bit first. Down with Ahab. Knowing a resident economic wizard, he already has a veritable, uh, veritable Bible of plans, proposals, and solutions to problems that no one asked for. Every waking hour of his life seems to be spent working regardless of whether or not he's paid for doing so. We all know the entirety of our economic success, and the man knows it, making him all the more insufferable to the financially illiterate. The fear's preoccupation, thankfully, means that he will not have to deal with the fear of emotional trauma, or the further emotional trauma from interacting with Ahad. The dinner shall instead follow the deputy fear of Kiesinger, one of the few men who can handle the overbearing economic minister. Very good. Very, very good. Anything else here? Um, I mean, we will be getting higher... Oh, yes, I shot that. And what do we got? Other three. Oh, uh, that's okay. Um, realistically, I'm just going to use this off. I don't want to spend any more PP on that stuff. But, at the stroke of a pen, Shapiro released a hush sigh as he looked down at the photographs taken during the roundup of the military still in Germany. His agents bringing them into cars, delivering them to the airports. From there, they would be sent out into Muscovy to be with the madman of an officer of the cursed Shona. At least Shapiro thought having these people generally encouraged out of the Reich and into the east would keep them from doing anything Shona would have wanted them to do while he was counting trees. <clears throat> the Fuhrer chuckled bitterly at the idea. The madman counting trees. He wondered if a Russian leader found some humor in the same idea he just found about right now. He eventually stood up, walked around his desk and out of his office, absentmindedly going through the corridors of the Chancellor, thinking about the things he and his government were free to do now that those people of the likes of Shona would finally be out of here. He stopped by a portrait of Mr. Hitler, or Herr Hitler, studying him in a more civilian attire. The Fuhrer once looked up to him, owing him owing him for the opportunities given to him. He earned much from what Hitler did, and now he was gone. At least now, Shabia Sp wondered, a new Germany wouldn't have to worry about these excesses which Hitler promoted. For now, Germany would be free of the warmongering dogs, for the good of the Reich. For the good of the Reich. That is what we do. The negotiator. What are they doing? Jan held his binoculars tightly to his face. Next to him, Miakka watched as well as he could, though the action was currently happening well down the street. I have no idea, Jan replied. There's a man in a suit. He's talking to the army right now. Maybe they're setting up a speakers? Uh, Jan looked over to Miakka in near disbelief. Are they negotiating? You can't be serious. Miakka responded, a similar look in his eyes. The Germans negotiating with the slaves? Untermensch? It didn't happen. Besides, why would they? Miakka and Jan would never say it aloud, out loud, but they, they knew that if the Germans really wanted to, they could steamroll any resistance the slaves could put up. Why would they negotiate? you you got to be seeing things. Get me the binoculars. Uh, Miyaka snatched the binoculars from Jan's eyes, pressing them to his own face. True enough, he watched as a man in the suit argued with a flustered officer. After a few moments, the man in the suit grabbed a microphone and began to stride forward. A stately voice blasted from the speakers engulfing the factory. Good afternoon, the voice boomed. My name is Helmut Schmidt, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Lead Diplomat of the Reich. I've come to discuss terms of surrender so that none may die on this day. With the cooperation, we can come to terms. Without it, the end result of this affair will be more bloody than either you or I want it to be. If you wish to cooperate, send a sign. With that, the man retreated back to the police cordon. Jan and Miyaka looked at each other again. A mix of disbelief, joy, and relief permeated through each of them. Perhaps they could succeed after all. Incredible! <laughs> How much PP do we get? 2.18? Not, not too bad. And since it's a 7-day focus, we gotta keep going on. Keep going. Actually, you know what? We're gonna get that political power. Uh, even though, uh, it's always gonna have spare political power. Well, we don't have to do that yet. Because we will lose political power here too, so we gotta keep an eye on that. Revival the Mittelstein. Education for all Germans. The average German. Yes! Unemployment subsidies will be moderately increased, so be it. Our GDP, or our deficit's looking not too bad, so we can afford it. Much has been done to help the average German, but not much of it has been direct, so to speak. It has mostly come in the form of increased opportunities for jobs and education, though he might understand if you sit down him and explain all the reforms to him, he can't really do that with every unenlightened individual on the Reich. Ehrhardt and Kiesinger have floated ideas for some relatively inexpensive and popular reforms that we can enact to improve the standing with more of the common people. First and foremost, they advocate for a modest increase to unemployment benefits, more expensive than other options on the table, but it would certainly silence the critics who claim that we have not gone far enough to help the chronically unemployed. What are you talking about, me? Education for all Germans, the NSDAP. To their eternal shame, never had an interest in educating the youth in anything but Hitlerite dogma. Bowman once famously proclaimed that every educated mind was a potential enemy. That this runs counter to all logic and common human decency, goes without saying. Kiesinka and Ehad have worked together to devise a way, to give hope to our youth, as well as anyone else who missed out during the Hitler years. A massive funding increase for schools will be issued as soon as possible. The Reichstag is almost wholly behind the idea, with only the clueless old fighters and stingy bureaucrats being opposed to it. Well, that works for us, since it clearly marks who, uh, who is fit to continue serving and who should be given the boot. Perhaps in the future. 
and it'll be today's youth who take their place in the halls of power, dining with Ehad. So what about your domestic policies? asked Ehad through a mouthful of breakfast. Have you convinced our illustrious daddy of the necessity yet? Kissinger, cautious as ever, finished chewing his potato before replying, well, he began, I think he's quite happy to fund education. I'm glad he can see the wisdom in that, at least. The Reichstag is on board, too. I assume they saw enough ill education in the party ranks to know what the cause is worthwhile. Ehad nodded enthusiastically, scarfing down a half of his sausage in one go. Good, good, that'll feed into the economic side of things. Great thinking, as for my own field. I think this round of reforms will be a lot more difficult than the last one. Oh god, I hope not. The mega corporations, yes, kissing go, kissing, reply kissing go. They certainly won't make our endeavor easier, that much certain. The uh, Pate Councilor smiled knowingly as he slipped. It's Franconian wine. I'm sure he had a plan of attack drawn up years ago, though. Eha chuckled, downing us cutlery. Well, naturally, it just makes sense to have contingency plans, doesn't it? I doubt even Herr Hitler could even fault me for that, you see. I. Kissinger had a pan. Just a short time version, Ludwig. Economics isn't my forte. The old economist rolled his eyes. We, well, we bring back the Mittelstand. We've been building it middle class. Now's the time to put it to use. Pull the rug out from under the corporation, sweep them aside, and let the entrepreneurs build something better in their place. Nobody loses except for Obs and his company. Let's see slavery compete with a healthy free market economy. Practical. Popular. Genius. The Treaty of Frankfurt. It's a miracle, huh? I'm telling you, Herr Schmidt. We can't accept that. We want to be free. There's not a compromise between freedom and slavery. Hemel Schmidt leaned back in his chair, rusting the bridge of his nose between his fingers. And I must tell you that I'm working with limited time and space here. You don't know how hard I needed to work to even get this chance to release you after a violent uprising. No, I would. it would never be allowed. I need you to work with me here. Then perhaps I will remind you, Herr Schmidt, that we still hold numerous hostages. There was a silence for a moment as both parties regarded each other. Though neither side could read the other's mind, both knew that they couldn't afford for the negotiations to fall through. For Schmidt, it could spell the end of his reputation. For the slaves, it could spell the end of the, their literal lives. There had to be compromise somewhere else. A bolt of inspiration struck Schmidt, and he took his chance. Look, I can't release everyone, but perhaps I can hit a middle ground. My proposal, you and the rest of your leaders surrender, and we try you fairly. The rest of the slaves are freed along with the hostages. If you take the deal, I promise none of you ever see a slave factory from the inside again. The slaves looked at each other. Schmidt attempted to hide his distress. Were they sharing looks of joy? Agreement? Distaste? He needed a result soon. No doubt that Speer was getting angsty at how long it was taking to strike a deal. The two men on the other side of the table looked back to Schmidt. Herr Schmidt, if you say what is true, we would be happy to accept imprisonment if our comrades go free. I'm sure the other leaders would feel the same. The prisoners couldn't see it, but the tension of the last days evaporated from Schmidt's body as he rose to shake their hands. A miracle. God, this is a roller coaster, man. This campaign has been one heck of a roller coaster. Oh, boy. And we are going to invest in the Volga right now. Get that one done so we can do the other focuses in the Mega Corporation tree. I'd love to charge people to treason, but we don't have the PP for it. Look at that. 473, not bad. Not bad. The briefing. Schmidt and the gang enter the room at all smiles, Schmidt himself carrying a healthy number of papers. Spato passively watched as Schmidt carefully set them in front of Speer, who began to look through them. Midway through the first one, he stopped looking back up to Schmidt. Hey, Schmidt, I'd prefer to not be looking through these all days. Is it possible for you to give me a summary? Schmidt smiled. Of course, my daddy. I flew, I flew to Frankfurt and engaged in dialogue with the slave leaders. Over the course of the next few days, we spoke to one another at the negotiating table, concluding in an agreement where, in exchange for the freedom of the hostages and the surrender of all arms, the leaders and the factory, we would let the slaves go free. Hold on, Schmidt interrupted. You let, the, you let all the slaves go free? As in all of them? Schmidt paused for a moment. My, my fear it was the only way to a successful deal. Schmidt said, Jesus Christ, the hell is going to be bad word shred me. Schmidt, do you understand? The conservatives, the militaries, the businesses, they're going to effing shred me. My fear it was the only way, Schmidt replied. His tone of voice hardened slightly. He attempted to continue, but was again interrupted by this time by Speidel. May I interrupt my fear? Schmidt a question. He continued before he got an answer. Well, the intentions of Herr Schmidt are certainly in the right place. I fear that we may see a wave of revolt among the slave populace when they learn of our softness on this issue. We need to stay on guard, perhaps raise security on major factories. Now, Schmidt was one interrupting. For God's sake, Spido, are you still going on about this? Your solution would have killed a hundred people, probably more. Sure, there could have been some unrest. Does it truly matter if we save lives? I'm not saying there was a worse choice. There certainly were worse solutions proposed. All I'm saying is that we need to be on guard. Schmidt threw his hands up in the air, mind fear. All the details are in the folders. I'm sure you can find them for yourself. With that, Schmidt departed, with both the gang and the Spido following shortly. All that remained in the room were Spare, his thoughts, and the mountain of papers on his desk. Get damage control ready. Honestly, like, when I was looking up the guide to do this, it said you had to send Schmidt alone we didn't really get him alone we just took the option to give us more reformists so i mean i guess technically he did go alone but like it didn't say he went alone <gasps> we have liquid reserves holy crap never mind we don't have any more reserves <laughs> the fruits of the economy oh, that's not bad will be greatly reduced um let's wait for that one 
Uh, let's see, industrial output. Oh, academic base, constructing new trade schools. The revival of blue collar jobs has had a good start, but the majority of the working class is still made up of unskilled laborers. While that might have had its uses, the Reich would benefit a lot more from having as many educated tradesmen as possible. You wouldn't send an untrained conscript to fight a war, and you shouldn't send a clueless young man to build a house. More trade schools, such as those previously proposed by Ehad, should be re established across the Reich. Having trade education more widely available will hopefully stimulate local enterprises and undermine the mega corporation's monopoly on manual labor. What was once a domain of dirt cheap slaves will once again be a core pillar of the German economy. Let us from the Reich to a great Führer Albert Speer, mein Führer. We are the Friedrich Wilhelm's Universität Club for Albert Speer in specific, and the United University Clubs for Albert Speer in general cannot commend your actions regarding the slave rebellion in Frankfurt higher. Indeed, there has been some concern that you would go back on your word regarding the freedom of all slaves when the news first passed to us. When the news came through that not only had you sent Helmut Schmidt to negotiate with the slaves, but it succeeded in your goals, I can only describe the mood as ecstatic. Indeed, we certify that in Germania. We held an impromptu rally and in your favor that was attended by at least a thousand fellow students. Such rallies were also reported to us by our other chains across Germany. We are so thankful to have a leader who truly is backing up his promises, and we are certain that this chain of action will continue. Know that no matter what forces try and stop you, we will always be behind you and your rule. Sincerely, Rudolf Wagner, head of the Univers United University Clubs for Albert Speer and to Führer Albert Speer. One cannot help but look at your recent choices to negotiate with slaves, the bottom tier of German society, with disdain and fear. We in the hair greatly worry over this recent course of action. Is it not true that we Aryans are superior to our slaves? If we treat our slaves like Aryans, then what will the meaning and power of the word even become? Suffice to say that many of us in the hair are more than a little displeased with the recent change in actions. Such foolish measures as negotiating with slaves will only lead to trouble and Western corruption in the future, and the notion that this Western corruption may be infiltrating even the highest levels of a government is very worrisome for all those who love our Reich and what we've built upon it. I can only implore you to change course immediately before the nation which we all love fails to Bolshevism and decadence. Sincerely, August Hans Meyer, Commander of the 2nd Regiment, 36th Division, at least it's mixed. Well, give it a hundred years and watch how far... Germany will have fallen, but in odd alliance. It was Kiesinger that Oberlander sought out. He was the only one of the reformists that seemed reasonable at times, and the president of the Reichstag figured that if any of Speer's clique was going to listen, to him it was a silver tongue. He spotted the former lawyer, as always, in the process of schmoozing some unsuspecting policymaker, no doubt trying to carry his favor for some ludicrous proposal of Speer's in the future. It gave Oberlander an odd spot of pleasure to be interrupting such a thing. Deputy Führer, the president of the Reichstag intoned when the conversation seemed to have hit a lull. We need to speak for a moment, if you are not too busy. Kiesinger shot an apologetic look at his companion, companions and excused himself. The two men walked for a moment until they were properly out of the man's earshot. Kiesinger gave Oberlander an expectant look, waiting for the president to speak. Is what I have heard true? Does she intend to dismantle Aji Fab and, and the other corporations? Yes, and for good reason. Kissinger wasted no time launching into a spiel. President Oberlander, you are an educated man, even holding a doctorate in economics. You know how these corporations have crippled the German economy? These companies have destroyed the German labor industry. The stranglehold on the markets is not just a travesty, but a crime. A crime against the Reich and the ideals of national socialism. It is the duty of the Führer to stop such things. Oberlander nodded. There's no need to convince me, Deputy Führer. I hold the leeches on the German state in as much contempt as you do. That r revelation, or revelation seemed to have taken Kiesinger by surprise. Hey, asked Kiesinger, I simply cannot come to, my assist to offer my assistance to the Führer in this brave endeavor. This is a matter of concern for all of Germany, and as president of the Reichstag, I throw my full support behind it. The rest of the conversation was much more protective. The two shook hands and parted ways. Nice. Very good. Yeah, after that one, the new workforce wouldn't be too bad. Future prospects for youth? That'd be really good. Uh, so let's get this one done first, and then... Oh, and uh, also there's Nesteram as well, but we're not going to do for a while, but aftershocks. I told you what happened, my Fira, and it has. Read the reports for yourself, or read the reports. Spado dropped a folder filled with paper directly under Spira's desk. Spira looked at it, and already knowing the contents, sighed deeply. Schmidt watched on, repressing his own anger at Spado's continued resistance. Hamburg, two gods dead, six slaves dead, a dozen wounded. Danzig, four gods dead, six slaves dead, another dozen wounded. Munich, same thing, 14 guards, 25 slaves, dozens wounded. The list goes on and on, mein Führer. Spado spoke with certainty of a man who had memorized these reports. Schmidt placed his head in his hands as Spado continued. It seems clear to me and many others that this was a poor course of action to take, and we are now seeing the results. Schmidt cut in, Herr Spado, when will you stop going about the darn decision? It was, I think it was a net positive. Of course you do, you came up with it, Spado spat. He turned to fish Schmidt, who seemed to grow angry by the second. And you say it is because we turned your proposals down, Schmidt pointed at Spado, who remained unmoved. We avoided it at a disaster by negotiating. Can you imagine the international response to us gunning down slaves? What about the students and reformists? Do you think they'd agree with running people over with tanks and cars? Well, the Chinese government would agree. Now it was Spado's turn to get angry. Herr Schmidt, it is your choice, not mine, that has led us into this mess. We would never see slave unrest to a scale if we had not enticed them to do so. 
Enough shit to spare. He said, snapping back up. What's done is done. There's no use of arguing about the darn point. If I hear one more argument about what we should or could have done, I'm throwing you both out of my office. There was a silence for a moment. Both Spado and Schmidt were caught off guard by Speer's outburst, when he usually was the only one to remain calm in these scenarios. Finally, both men exited the office, leaving Speer alone to ponder what could have been and what his actions would mean for Germany. What's done is done is indeed, and I'm glad we did it, because we got more pee, -pee. That's the only thing I care about, pee, -pee. Alright, uh, is it over here? Anything? Oh, no, not yet. I guess we have to finish this first. We did best in all the Eastern regimes. Oh, we, okay, we need more stability as well, so. This is not bad, but we're going to do a uh, guiding hand eventually, so okay. Granted some resources uncovered in the Eastern region at the benefit of GDP growth. Okay, well, that's all right. Um, uh, boon for businesses, uh, new workforce. Eh, why not? Our reforms have produced an entire generation of strong and reliable young men who are not confined to a fell growl for once. Who would have thought that for the supposedly indolent youth would be so eager to put down their own two hands to work just like their fathers would have done in better times? Perhaps we were witnessing the beginning of a new tradition of German craftsmanship and working class pride. We've gotten a lot of fantastic propaganda images out of this development, but Ehad boasts of something even better. Employment numbers. Unemployment is plummeting at rates not seen since the four-year plan back in the mid-30s. This time, though, our success is built not as a house of cards, but as fortress of, lime, of iron and stone. A peninsula return. Ah, oh, we got it, my friends. To all members of the Lechnach Rechtensdienst, Unternehmen Friedrich Sauf, Government de Krem, illegitimate state. Both operations were successful. Karl Dennis has been forced to resign, and the regime has promptly collapsed. The Wehrmacht is promptly moving in, and the reintegration of Crimea into the Reich should be finished within the next few weeks. Civilian and military losses are minimal, and destruction of industrial capacities almost none. Expected economic capacity of Crimea is nearly 100%. The fleet that Dönitz has taken will also be brought back into the Kriegsmarine, and every high-ranking officer will be tried for treason against Germany. Most are expected to be given prison sentences, some executed, but some released. With Crimea restored under German control, the last of the Reich's eastern territories returned to the fall. May Germany be in safe hands. Heim in the Reichs! Beautiful, my friends. Absolutely beautiful. I love it. We've got it. We've got it. we got it. we got it. we got it. See the battalion? No. Goodbye. Bye-bye! <laughs> oh, we can blow uh, and decker satellites. All it does is cost money, actually. That's not too bad. Uh, do we have any other options we could take? I don't mind doing other ones. If it's 86% chance, we could try one. How about Unternehmen and Alexim? The Organization of Free Nations, as they call themselves, has long been a thorn in the side of the Reich, after all. It is in this very organization that the Judeo-Bolshevism runs rampant and free in order to prevent the growth of American power. We all work to sabotage American-Canadian relations. With the release of a few recordings, doctored or not, and a reminder to the, to the few prominent Canadians about America's historical lack of respect, we may be able to drive a wedge between Canada and America, thus leaving the OFM bickering and disunited, unable to stand against the might of the Reich. We'll try it. You know, we'll try it. So we have three more left here. 5% more chance. 5% more chance. 5% more chance. Let's get more R&D growth first. There we go. Hopefully it goes well. 86% chance is pretty good, so I'm feeling pretty good about that. Anything up here, we have 58% uh, regime stability, which is not too bad. First blood. Antonin Grezevich, Grezevich was not fit for this kind of work. Forced to stay on his feet for hours on end, assembling car parts after car parts, and even sometimes hearing the crack of a whip and pa a pained yell that would always accompany it shortly afterwards. Life was not easy in Lutz, at least that's what it used to be called. Now it was called Litzmannstadt which is a 47-year-old man found to be a horrific butchering of the one of Poland cities. Yet he could do nothing about it, only toil and toil until his body gave out. One day, the piercing shriek of a whistle that would signify the beginning of the shift was absent. In its stead was a deafening, gritty voice that came over the entire factory. In his time of servitude, Antonin had learned German and was practically fluent in, which, seemed, which made understanding what was being said easy enough. It seemed to be an announcement of some kind as he listened in. The fingers grasping the assembly line tightened. Workers of the Reich, the voice exploded. Listen carefully. On the orders of the Führer, today we will be introducing two things. The first will be an overhaul of the factory. It will chiefly concern an increase in safety protocols, he said, and Antonin cracked a discreet smile. Since when do they care? Some of you will be receiving advanced training regarding new equipment being brought in. Next, you will be working with a few Germans. What? The... Who would have been des designated as being highly disciplined, efficient, and with a strong work ethic? As if the monstrous area knew anything other than bloodshed, Antonin thought a sudden fit of anger overtaking him. It will be in your best interest to cooperate with them, else the punishments for acting out on your beastly instincts will be extreme. That is all. Continue working. As a crackle of the voice faded and the whistle signaled the beginning of the day, Antonin saw several, several men walk into the building, unmarked. He scowled to himself, but he was no fool. The Germans settled themselves in, but the rest of the days passed with a silence that barely contained the intensive murderous aura that surrounded many of the Polish slaves working there. Even Antonin. But he wouldn't succumb. Even in this scum-sucking bottom-of-the-barrel life, opportunity would come. For what? He didn't know. But he knew that he couldn't work himself to death here and here. Not yet. The benevolence of Speer reveals itself. Hey, look at all the peepee -pee we got. You, me, we just love peepee. -pee. I mean, the more peepee -pee we got, the happier we are, right? Hey, overwhelming support, nice. Uh, fraternizing with the enemy. 
That day he felt particularly tired, rubbing his eyes as he passed the checkpoint into the factory. Anton floated in a thought in his head about calling off from work. But no, that was, this wasn't Poland. They'd only accept a delimming del del as an excuse, and even then, with his hiss laced together by a sigh, he noticed that a slight adjustment in the workers was made. This happened every few months, of course, but this time luck proved unfavorable towards Antonin. Walking into the factory, he should have expected it sooner or later, but actually seeing the man not particularly outstanding in any way, not even possessing the desired traits of an alien like blonde hair, was a thought running through his mind long enough for him to hear a shout behind him. It was the harsh voice of a factory overseer that graced his back which called him to back to his senses. With an awkward neck rub, Antonin went to his designated position. He was no fan of the Aryan, but that much he could say for certain. His dislike of the man next to him plagued his mind. What an insult for a German citizen and a Polish slave to be working side to side like this. Antonin's mind drowned out all the noise from the outside world as he thought, filled him with frustration about this awful fact. It was only when someone akin to a voice came through did his haze stop up and lift. Then he heard it again more clearly this time. Hey, uh, the other man began. Antonin tilted his head to the left slightly, enough to note that he was hearing, but also continued to stare at his work. You're Antonin, right? That's how your name was listed. No response. It took several seconds before the German continued. I'm Gottfried. I've just been thinking, if I'm going to be working here for a while, I might as well. That's when Antonin decided to turn all the way, giving him a cold glare. No talking on the job, he said, almost spitting venom. What sort of discipline do you have to be doing this? I, the other man, began, seemingly wanting to say something. Then he turned back to the assembly line, muttering, never mind. Then, the German backing down from the conversation struck Antonin as strange. Why did he even bother to engage in conversation in the first place? Did he not know who they were and who he was? He didn't bother to think about it any further. By the time the whistle rattled through his head, all Antonin wanted to do was sleep. Sleep for as long and as heartily as he could. One does not talk with the oppressor. Or, or do they? Hmm. Future prospects for the youth. The youth are the bedrock of the Spiat movement. We owe them so much for our success. They campaigned for us against the corrupt Orpo and Gestapo. They then fought, bled, and died for us in the Burger Krieg. It's only right and proper that the sacrifice be honored by the Fuhrer. And that is precisely what he has dedicated himself to in this moment. Now the children of the last world's generation are beginning to see the right promise to their parents. A right that would have never been possible under Hitler. Those who are mere boys and girls can now grow up with the prospect of choosing their own futures. That is true freedom. What all children come to desire. The fear is honored to be the man who made it possible. Never has the future of national socialism been so bright. And Africa's falling apart, but we don't care. Oh, here we are. Ah, oh, no. Great! Gotten land is ours. Hmm. My apologies. I just had some coffee, so. 5.4 million. I, as you can see, I'm avoiding a lot of the areas that have a lot of slaves. I'm going to hit them last, so. Um, oh, no slaves here, too. Look at that. Dalma Benz. I've not touched Fabin yet. There's just so many slaves there. It's looking pretty good. It's really not looking too bad now. And no, we don't have PP. We actually have command power, but not a PP. The be better end of the Reichstadt. Today, the inevitable has happened. Despite his boisterous proclamations, everyone knew that Hans Hütig would never have been able to keep almost half of Africa under his boot. With only a handful of fanatical loyalists and a dilapidated economy, it was only a matter of time before this castle in the air came crashing down. For months, native revolts increased in frequency and intensity, uncaring for the rapid retaliations and inflicting devastating losses on the overstretched SS patrols. City after city blacked out, road after road was taken, and with every passing day, the grip tightened on the besieged administration in Quillamay. But still, the madman would claim that everything would be returned under control with the appropriate amount of mass executions. Now we know for certain that the sun, black or not, has definitely set over the gross Afrikanische Reichstag. Aerial reconnaissance reports that Kulamein is aflame, and no sign can be found of Hans Hutig and his closest advisors, save for Otto Fulschner, who apparently managed to seize Leopoldville and the surrounding area with those SS who managed to survive the onslaught. Claiming to represent the legitimate continuation of Hutig's state, he employs the same methods used by his predecessor, though how a splinter faction from a rogue colony claimed anything resembling legitimacy remains a mystery. For us, this means the end of any dream of restoring German rule over Africa. With a failure to properly secure a foothold, and fortunate enclave ready to fall at the first breeze, there will be no way to ever set foot on the dark continent again without being saluted by a bullet aimed at the head. Darn Hutig, even in death, he still causes damage. Yeah. Oh, Hutig. But honestly, this is not too bad. Um, I would like to get uh, a little more political power. Can we do anything else here yet? Brasher shot's looking good. Oh, yes, we can do this one. Please, please, please. Uh, Norway? Is good. Or, that's yeah, Sweden. That part of Sweden is good. Close enough. Anything here? Civilian investment? Yes, please. We have a billion for the budget. We don't need them all. Nice. Is this still going on? How's this still going on? We won anyway, so I don't really care. Um, The fruits of the economy? Actually, do we have anything else over here yet? No, it doesn't look like it. That's fine. Uh, you know what, let's get the sins of the fathers. Just, I want that political power just in case. Before we can sit even at the same table with our partners from America, we have to show what we can go for without Hitler's influence. We are New Germany. Under the Republican Democratic Party, we must help them see who are, we are now instead of who we were before. What we are now must not be tainted by who we were before. Good. 
and keep an eye on this stuff. There you go. More regimes to build and we can do more stuff. Alright, okay, so that will be good to do. We can't do anything here yet again. That's fine, whatever. Um, Promote small businesses, stability. Stability would be nice, but we don't really need it right now. I'm going to go and do the cancer that is killing the Reich, because I want to get through all this stuff first, because we do get some more political power eventually, but the cancer that is killing the Reich. Though the Fuhrer privately maintains that slavery was necessary to win the Second World War, its continuation is untenable from both a moral and economic standpoint. Without slavery, the economic crush might have been more bearable, and our society would have never been so polarized. While the various factions within the Reich of motivations, ranging from selfless to the ra racialist, all but the most diehard fanatics and industrials agree that slavery must end. However, ending a system that has existed for more than 20 years will be neither simple nor easy. Abolition must be gradual and managed in a rational manner. Mass mass manumission would result in pure chaos across Europe and would harm the Reich far more in the short period of time than slavery ever did over two decades, which is true. Yeah, usually you don't want to be too radical in changing stuff, but you... Oh, never mind. That, that actually hurts really badly. Holy crap. Holy bad words. Oh, the military spending. There's so much military spending. Holy crud. Eh, it is what it is, you know. As you can tell, I'm not really concerning myself about uh, GDP in this campaign too much yet. Hey, we're... Sl Look at that! A reformist pivot! Not bad. That was actually pretty good. Honestly, right now, I'm kind of waiting for this other one to pop up here, where we can lower national, uh, national socialist influence, so... There we go. Look at that. Oh, well, they'll be with us very soon. And we have Ireland, too, so... Nice. The cancer that is killing the like. Oh, we're going to lose 50 PP anyway, so anywhere else? 3.1 million, 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 
It's gonna hurt us, but you know what? We're gonna max this baby out. Max that sucker out. 71% stability. And we're reformists. The Reich's cancer. In the early 40s, the war with our war industry unable to rally enough hands to maintain supply of new goods and equipment, we turned to one resource we had in quantity that remained unspent. Flash! Millions of prisoners, un to mention POWs, political enemies, occupied the concentration camps, being worked to death or starved to no end beyond extermination. As Abelman's minister, Abba Speer gave them a different entire fate, a fate entirely, to work day and night and unto death in the German war machine. Rather than breaking rocks and being tortured at the whims of SS guards, they would work the forges and assemble tools of death for the Wehrmacht. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Most men of fighting age were enlisted or conscripted to fight the plutocratic democracies of the West or the Bolshevik menace of the East. With women relegated to more appropriate roles, we were in desperate needs for hands. Any hands in our factories. Without the mass employment of forced labor, we could not have produced the mountain of armaments that allowed us to crush our foes with an ease that no capitalist economy could have matched. Slave forged tanks, guns, and plans were as essential to our victory as the strong German souls. However, slavery is growing completely out of control. No longer constrained by the state, our industrial leaders have developed a monopoly on the use of slavery, locking out most of the German populace with out of blue collar jobs. Even in agriculture has no room for free workers, as Prussian land magnates rented thousands of thousands, tens of thousands of slaves on the cheap from corporations in the Reichswerke and AG Farben. For this plague on the Reich to end, the power of the mega corporations must be permanently broken and deprived masses set free, no matter the cost. We've got our work cut out for us. Wow. Wow. A hundred more political power. Um, we're going to do this one. We're going to get hurt first. And meet in the banquet and get that extra political power. So, outmaneuvering the mega corporations. The largest obstacle we face in the noble endeavor is the Reich's mega corporations, Siemens, the Reichswecker, Daimler Benz, and IG Farben. All four make use of massive slave labor to varying degrees, with IG Farben easily being the worst offender. Using a workforce composed solely of slaves means immense profits for these corporations given their lucrative state and military contracts. Their CEOs enjoy lives of disgusting wealth and luxury entirely incongruent with National Socialism core principles, while the common people starve and slaves are ground to mulch in the millions. To tear the Reich free from the grip of mega corporations, we must be equal parts ruthless and cutting in our dealings with these parasites. Even with their most ardent supporters purged from the NSDAP and the bureaucracy, they wield considerable political influence in the Reich to say nothing of the economic clout. We cannot simply crush them, nor, but nor can we allow them any room to wiggle free from our grasp. This will be the greatest challenge for mandate yet over the moon. Helmut enjoyed the unique experience of a good cigarette and a glass of brandy at 20,000 feet. This job certainly had its benefits, even if it did work with unsavory characters in dangerous situations. Uh, the peculiar backsweep backswept wing of the plane made his view of the midnight earth below all the more expansive. It seemed as though he could see half the lights of Europe, but only half. The journey to France had become much longer since France had moved further away. The expansion of Burgundy, like a great tumor, was perhaps one of the most worst side effects of the Burgakrieg, one felt by the French more than anyone else. While Himmler's realm remained nominally part of the Reich, that was all alive to be believed by no one. From his perch above the world, he could see the boundary, a stark line between patches of light and utter blackness. Whilst he could not undo what he had done, he could try and make something better. That was a mantra that he had hold in his head more and more every day. The trouble that would be in weather the French would ever believe that. The plane began its slow fall to Bordeaux. Au revoir. Words which govern life and death. Trusco's smile was bright when he had read through the young staff officer's paper. So cleanly written, spirit laced with discipline and rolling through the letters with a stereotypical German efficiency that was lacking these days. His eyes looked upon the paper and towards the men, who looked no older than twenty-five yet seemed to possess a capacity and capability unmatched by any that may arrive from the academy. Say, he began, sitting the paper down, this almost writes like a poem. I'm surprised you haven't been promoted earlier. The praise gave the officer a shot of excitement and a slight smile. Though I have noticed something, your surname, are you... He raised an eyebrow related to General Grabner? The young man shook his head, no, sir, I'm an adult, the relative. Just go nodded. Can you tell me how old you are? It doesn't say on the paper, oddly enough. With a slight confusion, the man still answered with haste. I'm 31 years old, sir. The old marshal now put his hands together, eyebrows furrowing. I see. A suspicion crept up upon his mind. Do you know why you haven't been promoted? From what I've read, you seem more than fit to continue climbing up the ranks. To that, the officer simply scratched his head. I'm not sure, sir. I've only heard that it's been difficult to process my review paper. I was told that I would have to wait an extended period of time before having it submitted. Roughly two to three months, it's, he sighed, taking two years, however. So I'm glad to be finally be here. Trusco's hands clasped each other tightly. There was a question burning on his mind and the tip of his tongue. Perhaps he would be delving into a topic that he needn't bring up, but his conscience tugged at him to think otherwise. I don't care about it, Herr Grabner. A shame it took so long. I'm glad to have you, however. Nothing will be left untold. Cool. Synthetic oil. Oh, we're going to need that. Military investment, as you can see, I'm not doing that. Uh, this is what I want to do. We're going to hurt our regime stability a little bit, which is fine because we can keep doing this stuff, like extra stuff. So, But I'd, we need that political power, and stability is not too bad to have. So. Normal stability, normal stability. not Because we're at 75%. And hopefully this actually goes up since um, we're actually kind of reformist now. So, Not bad. <laughs> Look at that PP. Oh my gosh. 
75.4%. I wonder if it's really going to go up. But, meeting for banquet. Kissinger assures us that he has just the right tack for dealing with pro-slavery interests. Predictably, we will need to make a lot of concessions to keep them in line, but tax breaks and special treatment are small price to pay for the cooperation. Besides, the Reich is still a dictatorship. Once the Führer's position is safe from the corporate influence, we can adjust the arrangement as we please. The plan will be proposed to CEOs and officials from the mega corporations at an upcoming banquet to be held in the Führer's official residence. Everyone who is anyone in the corporate world will be in attendance along with enough prominent spirits to put pressure on those bloodsuckers and drown out any rumblings of discontent. Of the gone we meet. From the other window, Schmidt could see the once beautiful Bordeaux had sunk into stagnation. On the outskirts was what could only be described as a big tent city. Thousands of refugees from the Franco-Burgundian War. The once green fields had been churned to mud for miles around, and the Garonne had turned a sickly brown as the plane rolled to a stop and he exited onto the tarmac of the bordeaux Meragnac airport. However, the speedy for the French people was interrupted by the appearance of one. Pierre Bouget interrupted Schmidt in French before he could say a word. You didn't expect me yet, I know, but I will not waste my time here without knowing this meeting will come to some good. If the people found out you were here at all, I would be politically crucified. Germany must renounce Burgundy at every sense of the word. Every occupied piece of France must be recognized for what it is, and German claims must be abandoned over all. The world must know Burgundy for the rogue state it is. He took a deep breath, his mouth running faster than his lungs could follow in passion. And if you do not acquiesce to the condition, you might as well turn around and go back straight back to Germania. Well, miss neither Himmler nor Burgundy. Which words which uncover good and ill. Another set of papers, this time Trusco did not hold them so amicably in his hands. What he felt coursing through his fingers was not pride, it was a total absence of it. It was practically paranoia that drove him to scour through Grabner's records. A force drove him into committing. He had to find out. He had to make sure whether his suspicions were correct or not, or else he would lose entire nights of sleep over it. Yet if he was correct, he would lose them anyway. For guilt was a human emotion that lingered far longer than one would want it to. It took entire minutes for him to read through the text, focusing on the parts that were all related to Grabner's youth. A glint here and there. Passages were discussing his upbringing, his German focus, education, and finally the worst evidence of all. He was not born as Grabner, he was born as Philip Blazik. He was not born in Hamburg, he was born in Sosnovitz, formerly known as Sosnovich. He felt his heart drop. The product of his passivity, his failure to resist, has now manifested in the heart of Germany, staring him down in the face. Trusco's arms slowly began to tremble as he packed away the documents. He didn't want to look at them. Once was enough for the day, for a lifetime. The evil he committed that day, a resounding success for Hitler and his goon, and a catastrophe to his moral psyche. But did the man, young, young man have to know? He was content with his life, a false one, stolen from what he could have been, but stable nonetheless. If Trusco confronted him with a pest, the consequences could be disastrous. His, health, his heart burned at the thought. His body stood frozen over what felt like hours before he made his decision. He must know of his past. I've already sullied my hands with enough blood. I must leave him be. Um. Just because he knows of his past doesn't mean anything. Words which covet regret and sorrow. Um. I want to see. I want to see what happens. Like, if this is not good, I'll go back and replay this. But I do want to see what happens. I'm interested in seeing what happens. So. Oh my God, that pee, -pee is so bad. We actually have enough command power now. But. Uh, uh, why? Why must you paint us so? There you go. As you can tell, I don't really care about research right now. And we're actually do we're almost done building all these cities up. Where are we at? 21 billion something? Yeah, something like that. Whatever. And then preparing for nationalization. With the mega corporations so much appeased, we can go ahead with the next step of our abolition program. The nationalization of all privately owned slaves. Henceforth, each and every slave will be the sole property of the right government and shall be utilized and treated as a fear does himself destructs. That is this that this happens to mean far more humane treatment is an important bonus that will integrate ingratiate us with the slaves themselves, their foremost movement and the international community. Slaves can now expect generally less demanding work, ordinary hours of some basic decency. Of course, they are still not free, but anything is an improvement for them at this point. Perhaps future generations will ask, why did you not free the slaves immediately? And will think less of us for it. This, however, is a small sacrifice compared to the good that this program will do for the Reich. A dinner with Puget. The French truly understand the auto diplomacy or the fact that it was best performed at the dinner table. Schmidt was polishing off the last in a truly taken a pile of proliferals. Uh, and lit a cigarette to add to the metaphorical cherry. The mayor's pl palace, now the de facto residence of the French president, was a fine residence that seemed to have preserved from the chaos of the world outside a bubble of comfort in a city that still bore shell craters from its last war. Bouchard himself sat down in his cutlery and glanced at his guests. He had been quietly pleased when Schmidt had chosen to use French rather than German in their meeting. His very presence presented a great opportunity for both his country and for him, and he was not one to waste it with grandstanding and machismo. Neither, it appeared, was Schmidt. Of course, with a full reproachment, we must be treated with as equals. German treaties have strangled France for too long. Our armed forces must be free, and we might at least hold a line against Hitler's dogs. If we ever decide to come for what is left, we will not be some tributary state to your Reich. Hitler very diplomatically did not mention that Hitler had no concern for the dregs of France that were left. Truth be told, German intelligence had noticed several violations of the treaty already on France's part, but that could all be water under the bridge if he succeeded. Daring today, aren't we? Fair enough. Oh my god, let's pee pee. 
words which covet regret and sorrow. The young officers could see that there were bags under Tresco's eyes, even as he sat straight up. The old marshal seemed so very tired. Sir, he asked, taking his seat. Are you all right? He continued, putting on a tone of concern and severe caution. Tresco gave a staggered sigh. Hey, uh, <clears throat> uh, how do I put this? Uh, he trailed off, rubbing a hand against his forehead as he looked down at his table. Papers, though he could hardly read the letters with how blurred his vision felt, momentarily distracted him from what he was about to unfurl at the man in front of him. Trisco swallowed hard. He didn't notice how the officer became immediately more uncomfortable. I've checked into your records, and The words came from his mouth almost as if it were on autopilot. He spoke in detail about the officer's past, how he was never meant to be born and raised by Germans, how his cultural identity as a Polish man was struck down into the dirt, destroyed and covered up with a swastika, how ultimately his life was a lucky number, where he could have slaved away in the toil, worked to the bone and dying meaninglessly. He now sat here, promoted by one of the highest members of NSDAP, the bright red armband mocking him and everything he had ever known he had lost. But the Entresco found it hard to breathe and did not dare look at Philip, who only stared in utter shock. As Tresco put his elbow on the table and ran a hand through his hair, he heard something quiet and frantic, an excuse to leave, to think. He did not bid Philip goodbye, for, nor acknowledge the erratically paced footsteps and slamming of the door. Only a single thought, fueled by the mistakes of his past, haunted him. I have doomed yet another. Is it good to be honest? I don't know, man. I don't know. Sometimes it's good to be honest, sometimes it's not good to be honest. Digestive. A whole continent united in one economy. I will admit, it is an impressive idea, but why should I believe it would ever work? You have seen what is being bounded Germany at the at the hip brought France before? We were on the verge of bankruptcy long before Burgundy invaded. No, the people would not accept it. Schmidt could see the crumbling exterior of the Bordeaux from the balcony on which they enjoy their cigarettes, decaying from the mismanagement or neglect, but a great victim of circumstance. It will work because, unlike ten years ago, we have the finest economic minds of the Reich behind it. Hitler and his cronies shun a sensible policy for ideology, and our government intends to rectify his mistakes. I've seen the work of your Herr Erhard, and it's most impressive, nonetheless. No Frenchman would accept being thrown back into the German market without assurances. You must have our, you must have control of our own affairs if we are to join. We must have control. So be it. So be it. Man, that sucks so much. Words which cannot be taken back. The fate of the court, though. Pierre Pujad had been called away for some apparently urgent stately business, but he had certainly left Helmut with much to consider. Before he disappeared, he had presented his final and greatest demand. Schmidt had not been reasonable, or had not reason to consider Brittany for some time. The newly formed peninsular state had been one of Hitler's more peculiar ideas, ripped from France in the 50s as part of the divide and conquer strategy. He had heard Erhard cursing the Breton black market for undercutting many German goods in his eternal crusade to fix the economy, but other than that, their less savory entrepreneurial activities had largely kept them to themselves. The court of Nantes led them frozen in stasis. Pierre Bougiard insisted that Brittany once more be united with France. The court must be renounced, and France's territorial integrity restored, he said. But the French state was in no condition to amount such an invasion alone. As much as he burned to admit it, they needed German help. Um, you have our backing? We'll send support from invasion. Uh, that's a very bad idea. I guess we'll go with that one. Which words, of course. Trusco spent far too long staring at the envelope in his hands. He had unsealed it ten minutes ago, though his eyes only grazed the surface of the letter. How he wished he didn't have to look further down. Addressing the general field marshal Henning von Trusco, the phone on his desk rang, and he almost shot out of his chair from the sudden explosion of noise. In a few moments, however, he settled down and picked up the phone, holding it in one, with one hand as he held the letter in his other. Eyes continued to scroll through. A voice he recognized instantly came from the other side. Spears, Herr Trusco, he began. A great tragedy has struck the hair as of recent. Trisco made a grunt, and Speer looked as at a sign to continue. I've had the people tell me that you looked into the dreadful state these past few days. Bags under your eyes. Some of the officers have talked to me, say to you, that about you, you sound like you're not the most of there most of the time. As you know, we've recently promoted a certain officer named Akkad Grabner. However, recently he's been absent without notice for the past week. If anything has happened, I do advise telling me. If there's been some sort of clash happening with your subordinates that has been personally afflicting you, I can help resolve that matter. The sons of Nurse Speer. Uh, Herr, Herr Trisco? Having received no contact from Grabner after attempting to call him from his home, an investigation was launched and his body was found. Herr Trusco, the cause of death seems to be a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. My condolences go out to his family, for they will surely be grieved for his loss. I am sorry if you had to hear about this for the first time through his letter. Jennifer Marshall, he will be missed. Are you still there? Crap. Ah, uh, was that worth doing? I don't know. Um, I don't know. You know what? Maybe we'll go back and see what the other path would have been like. All right, everyone. So, nothing really happened with the thing, uh, with the other choice. I just, like, just... Kind of leave them be, kind of let things happen, but we'll see what happens in the future, but an important feast. So how are you going to sell it to them? Asked Kisinga, leaning back to avoid another face full of smoke. Eh, how it took a long drag of a cigar before replying, it doesn't need selling. They're going to lose their slaves and they're going to like it. The deputy fear looked perturbed. Ludwig, are you sure it's wise to... It's slavery, Kurt, eh, how interrupted curtly. Slavery, never forget that. We're going to fight... We're fighting to end one of the most evil institutions in history. The more ground we give, the more they will legitimize it, and that's one thing we must avoid at all costs. They'll expect a dozen concessions for every single man and woman set free. We can't have any of that. If Speer doesn't have the backbone to go for their throats, we'll do it ourselves. Kiesinger looked equally bemused and wary. I can't help but notice that you've already turned this into a joint effort on our part, Ludwig. Remember that if one of us goes down, so does the entire cabinet. 
and how it stubbed out his cigar on the fancy brass ashtray on his desk and smirked grimly. That's exactly the idea behind this bush. Remember, we still have a dictator on our side. Yes, this will kill relations between the state and industrial leaders, but that's what we want. Shapiro has already made himself quite popular. And if we can make a true abolitionist out of him, the people will never forget it. From there, the downfall of Obbs and his clique will be set in stone. It's just a matter of time. Freedom will be won at the dining table, and also we're doing preparing for nationalization, but fall rollo. Warpath. One trust had been surprised to hear of Schmidt's success in the French negotiations. The man had a sober tongue, but naturally actions speak louder than words. A demonstration of his friendship was in order, that de and that demonstration had been left to Henning and his staff at the OKW. The German troops would once more march through France, this time to undo what they did a decade previously. Once the news had arrived, or ordnance maps of Brittany, seized from French archives, were dug out for the first time in over a decade and combined with full-spectrum photographs from the Luftwaffe's best high-altitude spy planes. Road plans were updated as an industrial amount of paper devoted to printing local maps or printed local maps to be distributed to the French officers. Even a French Breton phrase book had been developed as a local language had overtaken the use of French in some areas. Air superiority would be easy to achieve, but they would have to be carefully planning their naval cordon. Breton smugglers had a thousand and one ways to sneak through a blockade, and it would be preferable to capture the government at that they could force a surrender. Actions along the Burgundian border were to be avoided whenever possible. A border skirmish at this time could develop into something disastrous, and Germany would be forced to respond in full force in the event of another franco burgundian war. Von Drusco shuddered at the thought. It was a good thing they would be there to supervise a weak and untested French army. Here was their chance to prove the metal. Here we go, and we must finish within four months, and we get military access, which is good, because I actually have been rushing my tanks and motorized over here as fast as humanly possible. So, we must get over here very, very quickly, if we possibly can. Can we get over there, actually, maybe? Yes, no? Okay, maybe not. Um, uh, I don't think we can ask for military access from anybody, right? No? No? Um, well, here we go. Send volunteers to France. Regime stability will go down. Considering the fall, our role and fall role, we will send Wehrmacht's volunteer units into, into the form of the Franco-German Freikorps. Send equipment to France. The French army is hopelessly unequipped. We will send their arms to aid their effort in the fall Rollo. Send reinforcements to France. With a Burgundian attack against France, the French government has lost several of its largest population centers. We will send volunteers to aid their reserves. Oh, maybe we can actually help them out. Okay, well, that's interesting. Fall Rollo is the Franco-German operation to regain control over Brittany in exchange for France's re-entry into the Einheit Pact. Like the eponymous Viking over a thousand years ago, Germany will establish its domain over France, with France's consent no matter how reluctantly it's given. So we need it to succeed, no matter what happens. So that's not good. We'll try to give them as much as we can. As you can see, we don't have a lot much political power. Uh, we're going to bug political enemies because we can. Um, we're still deploying some satellites, but yeah, not good. 77% regime stability, which is not too bad. And we can definitely use this political power, in which up next, I'm going to go ahead and do another focus as well to get us a little bit more political power. Uh, meeting with leadership. Negotiations with the Italian Empire are sure to be extremely difficult, as the political and diplomatic efforts in the last two decades have been completely focused on taking revenge for Atlantropa by turning the entirety of Europe against us. If we truly are to begin diplomatic talks with such a partner, then we can't afford a single mistake. The Reichskanzlei is, about, is abuzz with activity, as the Gang of Four and the closest collaborators are meeting with the Fuhrer to devise a strategy to make this endeavor to succeed. We need to be able to resist any criticism or accusation. The Italian diplomats are nothing but shrewd, a quality they show time and time again by taking their allies and sphere members from us, and they are surely sharpening their daggers as we speak. Now, really, my goal... Oh, great, sir. We, great. Thanks a lot, Italy. Um, is to just get pleepy. I'm not really going to go down that path towards uh, France, or not France, Italy and Japan, because that's like, probably the ones we really don't care about too much, because everything else ha has to be done. But also, I've made sure that, you know, up here is still good, over here is still good. Um, and we actually got Saporeshalja, as well as Sverin, as well, completely done. So, I'd like to get this done, but we have Serbia to deal with now. Many around the world wouldn't know it, but technically Serbia is an independent country. In actuality, it's little more than a German-led collaboration state. It certainly ran like one. Although relatively peaceful after the Second World War, the small state would see a huge influx in refugees entering its borders. Italian indifference to the plight of the Serbians in Albania and the other Italian-held regions in the Balkans meant that Serbia is one of the few places left that welcomed its own people. And even there, they face hardships. A country not ready to face such massive numbers of migrants and immigrants now has to deal with massive unemployment, poverty, and literal cities of tents for refugees who have nowhere else to go. To make matters worse, the situation is about to boil over. With more and more refugees entering the country by the day, the conditions in the many refugee camps are becoming unsustainable. The Italian government, ever generous, is offering a large amount of humanitarian aid to assist the Syrian people. And although this doesn't change the fact that the Italians are the largest contributor to the problem in the first place, something the government conveniently ignores. On the other side of the fence, the Germans are implementing their own work programs and sending economic assistance, while both sides try to play the Serbians against each other in an underground political battle. It isn't exactly clear who has the advantage or who has the Serbians hate more, but the result will be nothing short of entertaining if nothing else. The Serbians are just more pawns in the great game. I'm just going to go spend the PB, just get them all that stuff done. Uh, it's going to take time, and I want to make sure we actually win and get France into our side here. 
Oh, all right. So two and four. Manpower. I can. We can afford manpower loss. Uh, as long as oh, I can afford all this, that's not bad. Uh, I'll go with three to four. Three to four first. Good. And keep an eye down here. Very nice. Very nice. Oh, research two. Nice. And let's do camouflage. I like camouflage. Death of Puyi, so be it. That's unfortunate. An apology. No. Honestly, this stuff I'm not really concerned about. We're not going to really be doing this, so. I've heard that this side, the Japanese street, isn't really worth doing, so. Uh, increase your political power gain by 0.05. It's not bad, but going down and taking that much time to get that stuff really isn't interesting to me, so. Uh, Wehrmacht. Wehrmacht reform outlook. Indecisive, which grants. So. Oh, okay. Back to square one. Division limit. Eyes on the horizon. Reforge the hair. Oh, daily political power gain. No, 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 no. Prussia's glory. I like that one. That's not too bad. Salute. Attack and defense. Lose political power. Kill them all. Uh, why would we want to do this? Seriously. All this does is hurt us. Our professionals of supposedly goes up, but... Oh, that's not too bad. You get more political power, but you lose... You, you don't get any more. You just lose stuff. Yeah, you get some better army professionalism training, but still. Um, Daily political power of Von Tresco's hair is okay, but still. I'd rather do a revival of the Mittelstand. The bedrock of the old imperial German economy was Mittelstand. Small to medium-sized businesses that compete with each other in a healthy, liberal economic environment. Reliance on these businesses kept the middle class happy, the working class employed, and the upper class in check. More importantly, it prevented mop and monopolization of the economy, which is precisely the situation we've been trying to undo for three decades now. Working class people got a strong boost from our blue-collar training programs. It's now the turn of entrepreneurs and small business owners to receive our patronage. Tax breaks and cheap loans from the Reichsbank will help keep failing businesses alive and kickstart new ones. This will enrich the middle class, which will in turn enrich us, as they re represent the most profitable tax bracket of the population. Very good. Bug them. Anything else? Nope. Anything else? Uh, launch it. Ooh, the time has come. Let us sail forwards and fulfill our part in the deal with France, so we can finally reestablish our hegemony in Western Europe. Preparations: The French are pulling, putting finishing touches on the fall part of Fall Rollo. The invasion will commence soon. Okay. Oh, in four days. When failed, they get a lot of political power. Oh. Um. Then is there any point in doing these then? Um. We could launch it, but do we actually go there to help out? Let's see. Five and four. That's not bad. Um. Four, two, and four, two, and four. Doesn't matter. There you go. I mean, I don't mind helping them out, but if we go to war with Bernie, that would not be very good. Revival of the Mittelstand. Promote small businesses. Uh, let's do that one. The mega corporations have had it easy for too long. The dominance of the economy is such that ordinary Germans rarely even have the opportunity to see what the smaller competition has to offer. The war economy set up by Hitler and the NSDAP enabled the titans of industry to ruthlessly crush the life out of old Mittelstein, and they have tried to keep it that way, often with state support. This sentence today, though. The mega corporations have gotten too big for the boots and have no excuse for continuing to demand our help. Why would we support their interests when they actively work against the common good? How can they assist? How can assisting them possibly be worthwhile when they are the ones responsible for the long German depression in the first place? To heckle them, from now on, small businesses will once again be the heart of the German economy, as they always should have been. All right, can we, I wonder if we could send volunteers. I would really like to send volunteers to help them out. There's nothing we can do about it. Another meeting with Erhard. So Erhard, Erhard spare ground his teeth and forced himself to smile. It's been quite some time since we last talked about policy, hasn't it? I assume this conversation would be just as bracing. Without a word, Erhard stowed his cigarette between his teeth, reached down to his briefcase, and hauled up a textbook-sized folder, presumably stuffed to the brim with proposals, spreadsheets, and assorted financial documents. Speer continued smiling, but the light of a false enthusiasm winked out in his eyes. Oh, he murmured. I'm sure Kiesinger has already given you the abridged version, my fear, Erhard began. Simply put, we need the Mittelstand box. Small and medium-sized businesses were the bedrock of the German economy right up until Hitler started handing out government contracts to the party's biggest donors. We all know about how that turned out. We put a lot of effort into building a middle class, so it'll be crucial to our news policies. We have to rely on the established corporation as little as possible from now on. Don't issue them new contracts, don't engage with them, and don't indulge your requests. Should be a pause for a moment. He examined Erhard, blinking against the fragrant smoke drifting between them. He swallowed, but what if... No room for butts, my Fuhrer. You know the stakes of this game, and Abs and his lackeys won't compromise. Our plans are directly opposed to theirs, and they know it. Spear side. No chance to get a word in edgewise with Erhard. We'll have to deal with them directly at some point, Erhard. Yes, I know. I've scheduled a meeting for next week. You, me, and the four, four leading industrialists in the Reich. Uh, it'll be our moment of truth, my Fuhrer. Don't be afraid to lay down the law and put those scum in their place. Don't I have seen this? Did I already do this one? No, not that one. Not this one either. Okay, cool. 
acting on her promises. The abolition of slavery was the main promise of which Speer's success was predicated, far more problematic than any other aspect of the Reich. Its very nature offends German morality and degrades the national character. Its end will be the foremost subject of modern propaganda and diplomatic offenses, for it serves as a demonstration of our commitment to reforming and becoming a truly modern, th forward-thinking nation. More importantly, they, they re re grow restless. The slaves are acutely aware of Speer's promises and know that freedom awaits them. While at first this soothed their collective unrest, each day that passed without freedom drawn closer is another day in which a slave might himself seize it for himself. Pretty much. Cool. Awesome. Civilian stuff. We have a bigger budget every single year. Do they still need help? Hopefully they don't. They're looking like they're doing pretty darn well already, so... I hope we don't have to give them stuff, and stability is at 82%. That's actually really nice. Seven. This could go very poorly for us. I want to see if they jump up above that, so let's, let's give them a few days first. Oh, they lost the tile again. Sm promote small businesses, sideline the mega corporations, but acting under promises first. Um, I don't want to maybe send you a little bit more first. Uh, do you need manpower, guns? What do you need, guys? They have... Oh, Jesus Christ. They have enough guns. Oh, oh, we go to war with them. Okay. Yeah, let's launch it. That's fine. Oh, oh, we just go straight to war. Okay. I didn't realize that. Do we not have military access here? Okay, this is very weird. Uh, she had bog. And then do the same thing, basically, over here, too. Um... I guess something like that. Get the Navy going. That, that should be good enough. A boom for small businesses. Stuttgart, Wittenberg, Hohenzollern. Johann Weber, like many veterans, was deprived of the same prospects his parents had enjoyed by the crash of the 50s, with no more rewards to find no possibility of advancing through the ranks. Hell, Weber was forced to try his luck in the blue-collar job market. That, as most of the populace could tell you, was a futile endeavor. I hadn't realized during the war, Weber recalled, that the corporations on the home front would be so exploitative and cruel. I would wholly believe in the Fuhrer's promise that they were at his best beck and call. Perhaps they were for a time, but when I returned home, they had no work to offer, not for myself, my family, or friends, two men from a unit. Men who'd lived through both Barbarossa and the West Russian War committed suicide because they could not find no purpose in their daily lives once the Wehrmacht no longer needed them. Their old employer had been bought out by A.G. Fabin in the early 50s. As I spoke to him recently, I never thought I would have his life was ever so difficult. A few years ago, Herr Weber was living off the pittance that his pension would grant him. Now he is a proud green grocer who runs his own business, picture below. Here, he sells fresh produce from local farms, turning enough of a profit that he was recently able to purchase a home for his family. They now live in a modest but splendid country home just outside of Stuttgart. Of course, I owe all this to the new Fuhrer. Weber told me with a smile, I don't really understand economics, but whatever he's done has already given me a life that I've given up on so long ago. Some of my neighbors still scoff and call me a liberal, but that's a price I'll happily pay for the success. Heil Speer! Just one success story of many. Mmm, yeah. We gotta do as best we can here. And there's seven, so cool. And, um, honestly, Reichswerke, we have one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six. I think we'll save RG Falbin for the last. Maybe that's probably a really bad idea. Actually, that's probably a really bad idea. Um, the Tauen is so easy to get rid of, though. Reichswerke is would be super easy to get rid of, like that. Boom. Another one done. That's not bad. That's not bad at all. Go when you can. Do we even have supremacy yet? Where are the ships? Oh, you're all the way... Oh my god, are you kidding me? Okay, so... I think the AI took control of these ships or something. This is really bad. Switch goes in half. Um, yeah, the AI definitely took control of this stuff. Holy crap, this is, this is really bad. Oh crap, that's not really good. Uh, switch goes up even further. And then split them up from here. So that should be much faster. See, that's better than 38 days. 10 days max. 14 days. That's not too bad, actually. Acting on promises. Very good. Um, sure. Give them... Oh, 
while well, first. Silent and the Mega Corporations deny any involvement first. The fear's involvement is for enforced labor programs is very rarely accessible knowledge for anyone who cares to do some digging. The propagation of such unfortunate facts has already occurred in radical student circles and banned dissident groups. Should they be spread further, it would inflict irreparable damage to the fear's credibility and therefore its authority. Special attention must therefore be given to rabble rousers and overambitious reformist bureaucrats. The R&D will conduct a thorough audit of those privy to NSDAP records and deal with the most problematic individuals appropriately. Additionally, access to classified info pertaining to forced labor and the concentrations lager will be further restricted with the exception of whatever snippets can be used to benefit our cause naturally. I hope we can get more political power. I really do. Alright, let's see what they got for us. Crap. Well, we gotta go in. All the way. Cool. And they're calling all our allies, which is fine with us. Keep making more civvies. You're not you're never done. You're literally never done. And don't forget Brosh's shop. And the Krim. Are we good to go? I'm gonna wait till all the guys are ready to go. So three. Well, where do we get this one done then? Denying any involvement is good. Saving face. Nobody's gonna buy this. Grown spell, placing yet another propaganda poster on the rejected pile. He opened another middle envelope and produced another thick wad of paper, idly flicking through them with the air of a man knee deep in despair. Kissing goes and passive? Well, my fear. They were designed to your specifications. I'm sure the fine young men in the propaganda ministry are doing their jobs as best as they can. I'll ignore that comment, part I counselor Speer muttered as he glanced despairingly at a particularly unconvincing poster. I mean, really, look at this! He slammed down one of his desk and threw the rest of them over his shoulder, temper exhausted. It was a photograph showing a smiling, far too well-fed man in a striped and pajamas of a concentration gap and mate shaking hands with an equally jubilant and healthy-looking bureaucrat in full party, full party uniform. From masters and slaves and brothers and friends was stenciled on the bottom in bold yellowing, yellow lettering. That's a bit on the nose, conceded Kissinger, but it's hard to sell, mind you. It's slavery, after all. Speer shook his head. No, Kissinger. I told you, they're not slaves. They're foreign workers or involuntary laborers. We have to make sure our narrative stays consistent. Keasing your side. Apologies, my fear, but there's no sense playing with semantics. They are what they are. It's a bitter pill that the entire nation will have to swallow at some point. The fear looked lost. God only knew his subordinate thought that what could be running through the back channels of his conflicted mind. Fine, he said after several seconds of silence. Fine, we'll find another plan of attack then. You are dismissed, but I have to put in a call to Galen. Who knew facts could be so inconvenient? I don't want to lose any more political power right now. Silent the megacorporations. The best way to weaken the megacorporations is obvious. We should deprive them of business. Almost all state and military contracts have been rewarded to the four largest corporations in the Reich for the past 30 years, while countless small but promising enterprises have had, little, had the life choked out of them. It's time to give every good hardworking businessman a shot at doing business with the Reich government. Contracts previously given to megacorporations will be gradually rescinded, divided up, and reassigned by the Führer Directive. Meanwhile, new ones will be derived by a hard working conjunction with representatives from the business community. The Führer has voiced the concerns about decentralizing military production production, but Erhard has dismissed him, assuring him that there is no longer a need for ultra-centralized mass production of armaments. The Reichstag, Spado, and Bonsresco have given their own approval to the notion, so that all that is needed is a go-ahead from the Reich Chancellery. Good. Alright, are we good to go yet? Try it. All of our allies are coming in now. It's going crazy. We did cut military spending, so that's not really good either, but whatever. Come on, go, 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 go. We don't have time for this. And there you are. Sideline them. An economic revolution. The shelves of department stores filled with independent labels. Military gears stamped with markers, makers, makers, makers' marks from a dozen, dozen different factories. New pansons from startups and individual entrepreneurs passed through the Reich's bureaucracy as if being churned off like a production line. The German consumer can finally benefit from what we have worked so hard to produce, choice. He no longer has to resign himself to buying the same poor quality mass-produced junk from the Reich's largest corporations, consumer morale, for lack of a better term, has massively increased as a consequence. There's nothing compared to the economic benefits we are already beginning to see, however. Finally, all those business and economic degrees once considered mere scraps of paper are beginning to see some use, so long as the grousing of the mega-corporations is kept from becoming concrete action. We'll soon be seeing a boom to match the golden years of the Empire. Oh, that's not good. That's really not good, actually. Land, you bunch of... Dingus says, go there. If we can move fast enough, I do not want to do force attack. There we go. We got him. Go, go, go. Are you going to land or what? Why are you taking so long to land? Go to Can. Kane. Take everything from them and give them nothing. Go, go. Oh, they found us too. Oh, look at that. Huh. Funny people. Funny people. We got him. Oh, baby. That was not great. Oh, baby boy. We got him. An economic revolution. 
the great tax reduction, uh, the fruits of the economy. For the first time in more than 30 years, the ordinary German enjoys a lifestyle comparable to his American or Japanese counterparts. Parents can afford to give their children the upbringing they need. Affordable cars for the Autobahn and the new businesses spring up across the Reich like autumn wheat for the taxman's harvest. What baffles everyone, even the Fuhrer, is how easily this journey to prosperity was. Germans labored for decades under Hitler, always believing in pro promises that a better life was just around the corner. He always disappointed them, and no amount of wealth looted from France and the East could turn his short-lived gains into permanent success in our victory over the plutocracies of the Western Europe and America. We only found poverty and ruination. Now the fruits of plutocracy are available to all the Reich citizens to enjoy. And they begin to wonder, where lies the credit for the success? With a national social system which disappointed for years on end, or with a freedom granted by Speer and his inner circle? The answer may not be the Fuhrer the one wants to hear. But hey, we got we got this for these guys. So they should be part of us now, right? Good. Good. Dawn over Bordeaux. The tricolor was almost a forgotten sight in Brittany, but for the first time since the 50s, the region has been returned to its former owner. In Cain, the French rejoiced. The family split by a Burgundian invasion reunited once more as more of the Reich's missteps was undone. President Pierre Pujat's announcement of victory was met with a bout of celebration like the wishes, like the witch of France has not seen since the end of the Great War so many years ago. Schmidt himself lit a victory cigarette as he surveyed Bordeaux below him for the final time. Whilst he would gladly treat himself to more French hospitality for his time... Or his work here was done, and his time to enjoy the fruits of his labor were all too limited. There was always another task, and now that Germany had upheld its end of the bargain, it was time for the French, French to do the same. No doubt once his report was complete, he'd be dragged back into the minutia of Einheitsback laws and regulations, but there was enough time to enjoy his triumph. There was a beauty to Bordeaux, even in its diminished state. The great mayor's palace, arcing bridges over the Garonne, and the endless view of the Atlantic beyond, and the sun was rising a valiant corps rien d'impossible. Beautiful. And we got him in. Like We got him in, my friends. We've got the French in. Now all we gotta do is get the Serbians in, which we're struggling a little bit with them, but you know what? It could be a whole lot worse. We're looking extremely good. Like, this is looking really, really nice, actually, guys. At, at least according to my opinion. If you think so, please let me know in the comments below, but we'll have to wait to see what these guys have to do, and let's read one more focus before we end it here. Uh, an internal investigation. The ideologues have mostly been driven out, but there are still plenty of people in the NSAP, bureaucracy, and Wehrmacht who have quietly pushed to maintain the status quo. By definition, this includes the continuation of slavery, an unacceptable position for any politically reliable national socialist. As part of the modernization of the Reich, such reactionary elements must be swept from the halls of governance. Our reforms face a great deal of opposition from those who claim to be on our side already. We don't need these crypto Bormanite rats gnawing at our foundations too. The R&D and NSDAP reformers must be merciless in the immediate expulsion of all pro-slavery individuals, so that the tendencies of our government may be permanently corrected. And we can eventually do that one next time, as well as in New Germany. But I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it's kind of slow going through this campaign, but there's just so much to read, so much to learn. We have 20% annual GDP growth. I think we're doing quite well. But if you enjoyed it, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we'll continue to dismantle slavery and hopefully get Serbia on our side. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.